good. That's good to know. Hello, Facebook. Hello, YouTube. We are live on Facebook. We are live on YouTube. We are going to let people in. In two minutes here, we have Colonel Joseph Peterburs, who is in California. What part of California, Joe, are you in? Uh, Roseville. It's uh, right next to Sacramento. Okay, near Sacramento. It's the suburb of uh, Sacramento. Has it been hot there lately? Uh oh. Hmm, I don't know why it just disappeared. Uh oh. Maybe he accidentally pressed leave meeting. He press leave meeting. I have done that. I have done that more than once. Not only have I pressed leave meeting, I've been the host of a program. <laughs> and we will tell you this. And I pressed end meeting. We had over 100 people on. I ended the meeting. <laughs> well, let's hope he comes back on here. We got to watch for him. huh? Yeah. Uh... Otherwise, I could interview you, Todd. Or you oh, interview and I'll me. talk. I'll talk for ninety minutes. I'm sure they. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure we lose the audience in twenty minutes. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, oh, there oh. he is. I see him here. We'll admit Very him, and good. then maybe we can. All right. Woo, Joe. Woo. You're back. <laughs> Man, you scared us. <laughs> I think he's muted. He is muted. I'm sharing my sound. Okay, Joe, I am I'm going to, okay. There you are. You scared okay. us, Joe. All right. <laughs> Remember what happened? I don't know. We think you must have somehow clicked maybe leave meeting. No. <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh, yesterday when I was, uh, I, I, uh, I just touched the screen and that happened. Yes. They have come too close to the screen. I am going to start our theme music and we're going to let everybody in. The show is beginning. All right, here we go. Good evening and uh, welcome to our Veterans Breakfast Club Greatest Generation Live. I am Todd and I'm the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club and we are very pleased to be welcoming Colonel Joseph Peterburs to Greatest Generation Live. He is outside of Sacramento, California. And uh, we just were talking before um, we went live here and what a career Joe had. P-51 pilot shoots down an uh, ME-262 German jet, then gets shot down himself, taken prisoner, escapes, or he's allowed to leave, uh, fights with the Russians for a few weeks. Uh, then the war comes to an end. Then he's recalled for Korea. He hasn't flown for five years. They sent him back up in a P. Last time he was in a plane, he was shot down. They, they sent him back up, 76 missions in Korea, and then it's on to Vietnam. I mean, just a wonderful, fascinating career, and I'm so excited to to have him join us. And we have Glenn Flickinger, who's a host of our program. Thank you, Glenn, for, for joining uh, us. Uh, my pleasure. Glenn, how's the weather where you are? <laughs> in Pittsburgh? It's gorgeous in Pittsburgh. I know, I know. We are, it's the gorgeous day of the year in it, Pittsburgh. It is it's absolutely the top five day yeah. in Pittsburgh for the year. Yeah, but here we are. I'm in my attic. And uh, <laughs> we're, happy to, we're happy to be here, though. Um, and I do want to let people know before I throw the program, to, I want to say hi to Ellie. Hello, Ellie in Chicago. Um, and before uh, I, I throw the program to Glenn, I do want to uh, remind people that we do have a program on Wednesday morning, and we are going to have three uh, drill instructors, former drill instructors, people who um, were drill sergeants, and uh, it's going to be Carl Curtis, and Bart Wilmack and Veronica Conran. They're gonna be our three drill instructors. And so my expectation, I guess, for Wednesday morning is that they're just gonna, well, I'm gonna have to stop sharing my music. Um, they're just gonna have to, uh, they're just gonna be yelling at us the whole time. I, I don't know if that's actually how it works, but um, all right, here, let me, 
let me share this screen. Here's, here's what I picture. This is what I picture for Wednesday morning. Um, just kind of being yelled at. Well, we all have to hold bags on the Zoom screen over our heads. So if you want to do that Wednesday morning, join us, please. And then also uh, Monday night, June 28th, I do hope you'll consider joining us. And I want to, I, I hope, I hope Joe actually could make it as an Air Force veteran, retired colonel. This is an evening with Francis Gary Powers Jr. And I, I guess I like to say that anybody who's 70 years old or older, maybe late 60s or older, has a living memory of Francis Gary Powers. I mean, they remember the U2 incident from 1960. He was released or exchanged for another spy, Rudolf Abel, in 1962. I just watched that really good Steven Spielberg movie about it, Bridge of Spies, which I thought was excellent. And uh, Francis Gary Powers Jr. was a consultant on that film. And he's written a couple books about his father. And he's a, he's a good historian. He's a founder of the Cold War Museum in Northern Virginia. He's going to join us Monday night. This is a Zoom-only event. This will not be simulcast on Facebook or YouTube. You do have to register ahead of time for it. Uh, so please do join us. Uh, Ellie, if you could put in the chat on the Facebook side and on the Zoom side the link to register for this event. Uh, that would be helpful. Okay. So join us Wednesday, join us Monday. Glenn, thank you for hosting tonight and get, and having Joe on. Well, absolutely my pleasure. Uh, Joe, uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, it's an honor to have you on. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, spending two different sessions with Joe over the past week, uh, going through his career. And it's an amazing career. I'm always fascinated by men who have fought in uh, multiple wars, right? I always, you know, there were World War I, World War II guys, right? World War II Vietnam guys, World War II Korea. Um, Joe fought in four wars, as Todd mentioned earlier. World War II as a 19-year-old fighter pilot, uh, Korea as a 26, seven-year-old fighter pilot, then Vietnam uh, in, in a command and control function, and then, of course, in the backdrop from the uh, after World War II on was the Cold War. And Joe was in Europe in the 70s uh, uh, for the Cold War in another command and control position. So, Joe, we salute you for your service. And it's it's a pleasure to have you with us. Please say oh, you're very welcome, Joe. It's my pleasure. I enjoy it. You should. You should enjoy it. So Joe, uh, we've got the, the PowerPoint and we'll flash that up now and then. I'll ask Todd to do that now and then. But so it's uh, 1943 or so, you're graduating from high school, I think in 43? Yeah, well, it's 1942. Uh, okay. And, uh, and you're thinking about becoming a priest, I think you told me. Uh, yeah, I, was, uh, I had uh, been studying for the priest. Uh, and, uh, and I think in my third year in, uh, uh, we were uh, Pearl Harbor came, and I, I, I come from a military background, my father and brothers, and so I knew it immediately that I was going to join the service and be the priest, studying it for the priest. And uh, so on, uh, on the 25th of November, my 18th birthday, I took the competitive exam for uh, the aviation uh, cadet program. And I passed it, and on the 30th of, of uh, November of 1942, I was sworn in, and I went through a rigorous uh, training program for a year or so, and uh, I was commissioned as a uh, first lieutenant, 19-year-old, first, uh, second lieutenant uh, fighter pilot in Did April of 1944. Could you throw up slide number two for us for a couple of minutes? I think this is just a wonderful, wonderful uh, couple of uh, photos of, of Joe. Do, do you have it up there, Todd? Or you, the audience can see it? No. Uh, Glenn, I'm not as fast as I used to be. <laughs> I've slowed down. I've, li I've lost a step or so. So hold on a second. I am getting there. All right. Number I have to weigh up. 
oh, oh, oh. number two. Yep. You Sorry. know what? And that's the wrong one. That's, I think that's the, here we go. You want the number two. Yeah, slide two. Slide two. Got it, got it, got it. Oh, man. Okay, here we go. Slide two. Ready, share. No, oh, there I am. Okay, we'll use that one. <laughs> it's similar. Uh, so before, before I go, I've got a little box in front of my screen and it says leave meeting and got it. It's you know, it's right in front of the screen. What should I push from something there or get rid of it? Um, is there an X on the screen? As long as you don't press leave meeting, we're good. <laughs> We'd yeah. like you to okay. stick with us. If, if I push got it, will that leave the reset? You should be okay if you press got it. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Good. Good. Wow. Very nice. No, I, well, right. My, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was sweating that a little bit. So, Glenn, which slide would you want? This is the first slide in the series. Um, so the next slide. This one. Yeah, you're actually on the wrong slide deck. <laughs> you are kidding me. Yeah. Oh, I am. Am I really? Yeah, I am. It's, yep. All right. Oh, gosh. It's just, I just want to use the one that Joe and I walked through yesterday so that... <laughs> And I'm so sorry, Glenn. We just talked nope. about this too. Not a problem. All right, I'll I'll, I'll get there. Why don't you? Why don't you? you yeah. know, sing so, a song a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So 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 Joe, you're you're 19 years old. Uh, you go into uh, flight training. Uh, tell us a little bit about the flight training. Was that in California at first, or did you get moved? Oh, no, no. All all my training was done in the southeast United States, southeast. Alabama, Georgia, Florida. Uh, Area, and uh, I, my my first uh, uh, really uh, uh, towards the flight. You know, I went through the main the the regular army basic training train uh, at Miami Beach, which was really tough. Yeah. <laughs> nice place to train. <laughs> yeah, really nice. And uh, is anyway, we, th then I was a uh, 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 my first uh, flying, the first time I was ever in an airplane was this PC, PT-17 uh, Stearman at uh, Cochrane, at Douglas Field, Georgia. And, uh, that I was there in the, uh, about uh, on October, September and October of 1943. I, I soloed in about six hours and uh, got about six and five hours in uh, this aircraft. So, Joe, it's, it's a biplane, it's, and it looks a just a little better than a kite. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that like the, in your first experience? Of oh, snowing? really, really beautiful. beautiful. Uh, the, the instructor sat up front, and uh, the students sat, sat in the back. And uh, you had a, what they called a what, something or other. But it was like a funnel with a, with a hose on it to the other guy. <laughs> you talk to it. And you put it up the year, that sort of stuff. And uh, very minimal uh, instruments. I think there were only three or four interest, uh, instruments. Uh, and uh, did basic, uh, learned, learned how to do uh, eights and uh, uh, lazy eights and uh, a lot of aerobatics, uh, rolls, spins. And, and you gradually, gradually move on. If you put the next slide up, Todd, you gradually move on to uh, more sophisticated and powerful yeah. planes, step by step. Yeah, okay, this is uh, the next one I flew was the uh, BT-13, uh, and that was at Cochran Field in uh, Georgia. And uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, or it's all metal, a uh, single wing, uh, and uh, it has a closed cockpit, of course, a lot more uh, communication uh, capability between pilot and instructor. And uh, that I, I spent, I got about 85 hours. And, and, uh, this, uh, when we graduated, there wasn't enough room in the... Uh, that's so we had to spend another month, so we got another 20, 30 hours in the thing uh, before we proceeded to uh, the uh, Napier Field, which I flew the uh, T6 uh, Texan, and that was a 
you know, much more powerful engine, retractable gears, uh, much more advanced than the GT13. And uh, there uh, was in the uh, uh, aerobatic group uh, and uh, really did a, a fine job there. <laughs> I, I, I really honed my skills there. But there you realize that, you know, things are are not just play anymore. You're really, you're going to be in the war pretty soon. That was the last uh, aircraft before you got permission and got a pilot and you'd be assigned. And then I was, uh, from there, I, I proceeded to, uh, uh, after I graduated, uh, that's the aircraft that flew until I graduated, the T-6. And uh, uh, graduated on the 15th of April of 1944 and uh, then checked out of the, the P-40N, the Warhol, uh, which is the plate, the type of aircraft that the Flying Tigers were using. Right. And uh, then we was sent down to uh, uh, Napier Field and, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, Napier Field, Fort Myers, uh, Florida, not Napier Field, uh, Page Field, Fort Myers, Florida. And uh, that was uh, called the Replacement Training uh, uh, Unit, which uh, trained pilots for replacement, replace combat pilots who are returning. And, and Joe, let, let me ask, while, while you're going through all this training, <clears throat> how many other guys were washing out of the program? Uh, we had, well, starting with the, the competitive exam, 50% washed out of the competitive exam to get in to begin with. And then all along the way, in each step, uh, there were, there are various, any place from uh, a 20% to a 30 or 40% uh, washout rate, uh, depending on the aircraft circumstance. So if I do my math right, from, from the very start. The difficulty of the trading. And so. From the competitive exam to the last uh, bit of training, maybe 10% of the board. Oh. Pilots make much it. larger than that. Well, I'd, I'd say throughout the whole thing, I would say at least uh, well, 30, 35 percent uh, washed out. Right, right. So the successful ones were uh, maybe 10 percent of the total. Yeah, we're the cream of the trap. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <Cream> <laughs> what, what were they looking for, Joe? What, what were they were looking oh. for? The Mechanical skills to, to do all those acrobatics well, and well, one of the things before one of the we went to the Nashville Tennessee for for see when you're in the cadet program up until this time uh, when we went to uh, classification we could have become a navigator a pilot or a bombardier so at, at Nashville they had psychomotor tests and uh, and psychology psychological tests. And uh, that sort of thing. And it was, uh, uh, I remember like this, uh, the psychomotor test, uh, it was like a Victrola. I don't know if you know on the head. But anyway, that, that disc is going around. Yeah. You had a pen and there was a dot on that thing and you had to keep your, your pen on that dot and it went around. So what that proved, I don't know, but it must have done something. And then we had a lot of psychological uh, uh, you know, from our psychiatrists to assessments, our profile. brains and stuff. Yeah. yeah so, so anyway, the, and then you were determined that would determine whether you're going to go to bomber, a be a bomber, bombardier, a navigator, or a pilot. Like, so I was classified as a potential fighter pilot. So that's what I, that's where my training was directed. So all of my stuff was uh, in, in single engine uh, traders uh, leading up to uh, Yeah. So you think they were looking for young, highly skilled, mentally tough, aggressive 19 and 20 year olds for these p fighter pilot positions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most of the guys are the aggressive. Oh. How old were the other guys around you that made it to fighter pilots? How old were, how old were they? 
how old were the other guys around you? Your- well, they were all, you know, 19, uh, 18, 19, 20 years old as we went to see them. Uh, I was one of the younger ones. I mean, you know, I'd say probably, uh, probably 15, 20% were in my age bracket. Then the others were 21, uh, 20, 19, 20, 20, 21, that bracket. But, uh, you know, if you were uh, much over 23, you were you know, considered an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> So you get to uh, November of 1944, and that's when you ship out to uh, to England. Yeah, yeah. on the on the first of November of 1944, I boarded the Ile de France, the French luxury liner that uh, was converted to a troop ship, ship, and then headed without convoy. Most of the traffic across the Atlantic had. Uh, Done with escorted uh, in convoys, but uh, the Queen Mary, which had also had been a converted uh, tra- uh, to a, a uh, troop carrier, uh, we made it across the Atlantic uh, solo because we were so fast we could not run the submarines. Anyway, I, I arrived in Scotland on the fifth or sixth of November. I can't remember. And, and to make it clear you're going as a replacement pilot. You're not part of a fighter group or fighter No, squad. that's right. We're going as replacements. Replacements. Yeah. Right, right. And so then, we get to Scotland and I, I uh, get some paperwork done there and we get our assignments. Which we don't know where we're going yet. So we're putting the two and a half ton truck and, in the back and uh, take a drive. And after a couple hours of driving, we into this uh, RAF station, and it's the RAF station Kings Cliff uh, near uh, Peterborough, and uh, about 90 miles north of London. And that's the home of the 20th Fighter Group, the 55th Fighter Squadron, and that's where I was assigned. And you're walking the door, and, and fly, the- they were flying B 51s, too. So we, I, none of us had, there were seven of us, and I keep saying us because. There were seven of us that had went through training sort of together uh, near the last stages anyway. Uh, a couple of them were guys that we went through from, from primary through the whole training program. Pretty good fans. Uh, now, were you, were you and your buddies praying for P-51s at that point? <laughs> Well, yes, 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 we were. <laughs> yeah, because that's the so, Corvette. We were hoping that yeah. that's what we had. See, the, the the unit that we were assigned to originally had P-38s. And, and uh, just just before D-Day, they were transferred from P-38s to P-51s. So right. uh, actually, with our time in the P-40, we had more time in the The, uh, the P-40, then uh, they had, I had over 240 hours of the P-40 by the time I got there. So, uh, transitioning to a P-51 was nothing. To me. Fifteen, I got 15 hours in the P-51 A, B, no, B, C, and D model, and then started flying combat. And that, that was the incredible advantage, Joe, is that right, that, that we had, or the United States had is to turn out these brand new pilots, brand new to combat with 250, 300 hours of training. Mm-hmm. Where by that time, the Germans were down to oh, they were, with, that could barely fly the plane. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They had, uh, they got through a lot, a lot, a lot of pilots, their experienced pilots, and they were trying to push them out. Right. right. So you start flying combat missions in late 1944? No, yeah, in late 1944, the first my first mission was on uh, 13th of December or something like that. Yeah, yeah. 1944. Right, right. And uh, then, uh, okay, this is my, my, my aircraft, Josephine, I named after my fiance, Josephine Hefner, who was waiting for me back in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
and uh, the uh, there I'm, I think that I'm, I made uh, first lieutenant made first lieutenant in February of uh, forty five, and uh, and then uh, this one here was a hundred percent the victor of three of us a hundred percent casualties. Uh, two good friends, uh, Leon, both killed in action, and uh, I was shot down at the POW. Oh. So, uh, yeah. so, Joe, you described for me in one of our discussions, uh, yeah, this is your, your 14th, uh, 14th of January, your, uh, one of your key missions we're going to, but before we get to talking about that, you know, we talked about what exactly you, you your, the fighters did, right? Escorting these huge bomber groups. And by this time- okay, Well, the, our primary, yeah, our pri the, By this time, the war- primary the, job was the es escorting the bombers to the target. Right. But there's seven, 800, 900 bombers in these bomber streams, right? With- 700, 800 fighter planes protecting them. Yep. What did that look like, Joe? What, I mean, when it you looked like a, a fight, a mass, I mean, mass of aircraft. Could you see it all? Could you even see it all in one well, view? Well, no, no. You were you were limited uh, to the uh, the scope of the area you were in. Your you'd be usually uh, your group would be usually uh, 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 escorting a. A division of uh, the bombers, uh, like, and uh, I, I, I don't, this is probably for, we've escorted mostly the first division bombers, but within that division, there are groups, or there are wings and groups uh, within the uh, uh, that uh, it breaks down where you'd be escorting a group of uh, three or four of our squadron. I mean, our uh, group of fighters uh, would be escorting a group of, uh, of bombers. And then uh, the, another unit, another fighter unit would be is escorting another group of bombers and so on. Yeah. So you, your, your perspective was mainly within that the circle that you're, that you're responsible for. Right. Uh, but uh, the... Uh, for instance, uh, in this picture that you have on screen now, uh, it's the whole force was uh, hit by uh, several hundred uh, uh, German uh, fighters. Uh, the uh, FW-190 uh, uh, and the uh, Lockwell uh, FW one nine, uh, maybe an initial with one full eight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, the the one oh eight was uh, would be hit and run. If their tactic would they come through uh, the bombers and uh, hit, try to hit and then uh, run and draw the fighters away. And then the F, if fighters were drawn away, then when the fighters were drawn away, the uh, 90s would come down and chew up the bombers. So, you know, different groups. Uh, uh, our our group, we we were that did not go chasing uh, the other, uh, stayed with the bombers. But in this particular uh, battle, there were, it was my first encounter with uh, enemy fighters. And, uh, it was the uh, I mean there were bombers. Blowing up all over the place, parachutes in the air, uh, wings falling, engines falling, and it was uh, really, you know, your mind could, my mind could just get a hold of it, just like a, a pandemonium. And uh, I came uh, head on to the, the FW uh, 190 and uh, uh, her playing chicken, uh, firing, just coming head on, and doing about 400, and I'm doing about 400 with 800 knot closing speed. And uh, my 50s are coming at him, and his 20s are coming at me. And uh, if you you see behind the 109, the B, the, the, the aircraft, KIB, uh, is my aircraft. 
then the aircraft, then the, the one right in front of me is a, the 190, and the one behind the 190 is my flight leader, Captain Frickdevick. And, uh, and he, does, he, can't shoot at, he can't shoot at the 190 because he's afraid that it would hit me. You know, I was such close proximity. So anyway, I pass under the 190. I get some hits about him, but I pass under the 190. And as soon as I pass under, I freaking pop him and he just turned away. So uh, that was a really exhilarating experience. But uh, it, was, it was really, uh, you know, I, I was really, I was laughing. I was thinking, what kind of a... You know, what am I into here? This is, this is really wild. And uh, it was. But uh, it was really, really, really exciting. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm 100% sure I'd have been crying. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Joe. This is Todd. Would you mind if I asked you a question? First of all, were you really laughing in the cockpit at that time? Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. And then second of all, I have a, uh, I guess, a stupid question. Uh, if I'd like to draw everybody's attention, this is a mission on the 14th of January, 1945, 700 B-17s and B-24s, 900 escorts, that's 1,600 airplanes flying in, you know, fairly close proximity to each other. And then you throw in the hundreds of enemy planes. Is there a danger of just running into your own planes, planes running into each other, being hit by a falling wing. I mean, is that always? Yes, that, the... is, that was always possible, always possible. And that's, that's, I think, what I was really laughing at. So, you know, the, I, I was more concerned about the falling parts and, and, maybe, and maybe running into a parachute or something than I was the, of, uh, of the enemy aircraft. That, that's just how it, how it struck me. And Joe, this this was how many hours in the air on this mission? Oh, I I, I, I have that mission someplace. I don't know. I, it's probably about uh, this is probably about a six hour mission. Wow, five and a half six hour mission. And 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 this battle. We were going to Magdeburg, Robert. And this was just outside of Magdeburg that the, 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 the fight started. So. It was, it was a good five, five, six hour mission. And this air battle that is depicted here, took how long? 10 minutes, 20 minutes? Oh, uh, I'd say uh, about, uh, probably 15, 20 minutes, something like that. So it's hours of Before board. Things that, of course, then, of course, in the, 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 you know, there were dog fights going on. There was, you know, up at, from 30,000 feet down to the, to the deck, we're chasing, you know, chasing a, a, a German down to the deck, they're up in the air, and these dog fights were going on all over from Berlin down to, uh, to Magdeburg, from 30,000 feet down to 1,000 uh, feet. It's almost unfathomable for us. <laughs> Uh, Joe, to imagine what this looked like and felt like. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. When you landed, Joe, what were your feelings? When you landed, uh, you're safe, you're... Ticked off because I didn't get a couple Germans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, the, it, it, was the, it was the time, you, you know, I, I, I realized that you look back in perspective, to try to bring this into perspective. This is just our daily, you know, this is our daily life. This is what we were doing. And this was a little more exciting than some of the others, but there were other things, you know, like another mission they flew, uh, blew up a bunch of uh, rail trap. I mean, it was down on the ground, dirty and, uh, and you know, getting getting the heck shot out again and that sort of stuff, straightening and destroying uh, engines and boxcars and all that sort of stuff. Joe, were, were those, um, as I've read the history, referred to as fighter sweeps, where there were no bombers in the area for you to protect, 
just masses of fighters down on the deck looking for railroad cars, targets yeah. of opportunity, et cetera. Yeah. You participated in that as well? Oh, yes, yes. yes. We, we had, of course, our, like I said, our primary mission was uh, escorting the bombers. We also had missions, uh, pre-brief fighter sweeps where the whole group would go out and our job was to look for targets of opportunity. Or like in the Ramagan Bridgehead, to protect the troops, uh, you know, the air, and I'm sure they, of course, during D-Day, uh, you know, I was, it was long before I got there, but uh, during D-Day, the fighters were up there uh, yeah. protecting the, uh, the landing area uh, from uh, enemy fighters coming down and striking, you know, strafing. Can you imagine on D-Day, if some German fighters would have got down there, striking that beach, beach with 20 and 50 kilometer Cannon shells, it would have been uh, yeah, a lot more disastrous than it already was. And, and Joe, we, it's, it, we don't have the picture in this particular deck, but there's another picture of you on a mission during the Battle of the Bulge. Can you recount for us what, what you did during the Battle of the Bulge? Oh, that, that was the, uh, another uh, fighter sweep, but uh, I think see, that was. I mean, it's just down strafing uh, yeah. targets of opportunity, <laughs> ground, uh, ground traffic, and uh, that's what's. Did, uh, did they did they explain to you what what happened on the ground that you know caused the Battle of the Bulge? Were you aware of what the well, ground? No, we, no, we didn't. We really didn't get into the whole. You know, we we had our little bubble that we were. Living in and our what our mission was, uh, we were briefed before each mission where the uh, the uh, front lines were for the Allied troops and the, uh, and the Germans. We were briefed about how where the fighters, the German fighters, were based and located. So we knew if we were going in that area, Steinhuder Lake was one of them where they had a big German fighter force stationed in, in that area. That if you're going up there, you're pretty sure you're going to be uh, hit by fighters. And then uh, there's also uh, 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 oh, briefings on uh, slack uh, uh, ground defenses around places. And then, and then they would be briefing on, on, uh, like on uh, the brief on uh, how the Germans were getting after the fighters. All, you know, general areas that we could be able to find stupid targets. And uh, so that, you know, that was it. But as far as the, you know, the overall, even the overall air war thing, uh, you know, from the bombers uh, point of view and, and fighters point of view. And of course in the Ninth Air Force, they were doing mostly tactics. Ninth Air Force was pr were primarily involved in, in uh, striking uh, ground targets and, Right. You know, they were supporting a soup. Yeah. They so had the you know, P-47 P40, mm -hmm. that had eight fifty caliber machine guns. And, and uh, you know, they, that was a tremendous aircraft. Todd, you, you were going to ask? Yeah, I'm going to interrupt. We have a question from Brian Schnick who asked, did you feel safer, Joe, in a P-40 or a P-51? Oh, a P-51. It was, you know, much better uh, aircraft. Uh, Technology wise, it, it had uh, you know uh, features that uh, I, I I enjoyed flying the P forty because it was to me it was like a big a, a big stir, steerman you know it was a really maneuverable uh, fine aerobatic that was fun flying but as far as uh, you know there's no no match uh, with a P forty with a, a one hundred and nine or and then I love uh, Eric Gillard. I had the same question. How do you, <laughs> sorry for laughing. How do you go to the bathroom? Uh, <laughs> other pilots here on the Zoom call answered in a relief tube, right? That's correct. Relief tube. But it's a very seldom ever work very well. So. <laughs> <laughs> because you're up there and you're, you're in 50 below zero weather. And uh, it's, you know, very, it's a, uh, uh, 
very difficult. And uh, when you're shrunk up so that you can't get to the recoup tube, you know where you have to go. So. <laughs> all right. I think that's all we need to hear about. <laughs> well, I got a similar question, Joe. Uh, six hours in that thing. Did you guys have like a ham sandwich or a Snickers bar to eat on the way back? No, no. No, no. I don't remember every I don't remember ever taking anything in all my missions. Not wow. once. Wow. Okay, Joe, let's let's uh let's get to uh, the next slide there, uh Todd. Yeah. This is the 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 fascinating experience that 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 Colonel Peter Burrs has. So it's his 49th mission. It's the 10th of April, nearing the end of the war. Uh, the Russians are, uh, I think, in the process of surrounding Berlin. I'm not sure they're in Berlin yet, but they're surrounding Berlin. Our troops had stopped at the uh, Elbe River. I think it was the Elbe, if I got that right. Elba, Elba River. And Joe, uh, give us uh, sort of a blow by blow here, very slowly, as to what happened okay. to that day. Okay, we'll start at the left side of the map where you see 1,300 bombers and some 905 fighters uh, escorting the bombers. And we rendezvoused at Osnabrück. You can see I've inserted some P-51s and bombers up there so to give you an idea of what that was like. Uh, the fighters, of course, we were well inside of Germany before, Germany before we met up with the bombers. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that by the slide. And then we went on uh, the whole force now, we're talking about the Turkey force of 1,300 bombers and all the fighters were all together, all the way from where we hit, uh, uh, where we rendezvoused and then on towards uh, Raj fight. And, uh, yeah, right there. And then the bombers start splitting off to their targets. A group of bombers went to bomb Magdeburg. One group went to bomb Pap, uh, Potsdam. The other group uh, went to bomb Berlin. Berlin, And the bombers that I was escorting, and our group was escorting, went to uh, Oranienburg, which is uh, just north of Berlin. And as their... Uh, we uh, we uh, entered uh, the area. The bombers uh, dropped their bombs. Basically, a sort of a uh, very uneventful mission up until that time. The bombers dropped, and they are come just almost simultaneously with the bombs drop. We were hit by a swarm of Mb 262s uh, German turbojets, and I saw. Uh, I was flying high cover. I had about 5,000 feet, uh, right, right around 30,000. I was flying, uh, uh, and I, I looked down, and, I, and the bombers were about 25,000. I looked down, and I see the, this uh, ME-262 start pulling in. As soon as I saw this 262, I, I rolled over and start after them, and I got my throttle wide open, diving at them at extremely high rate of speed. And uh, uh, as I pull into, and, and, well, just as I, I roll over and start after him, he pulls up that B-17. And then he, he switches over to another one. And just as I get into his... Todd, switch to the next slide. It has a nice picture of this. Ah, okay. Hold on. I'll get it back up again. Hold on a second. All right, Joe. Just wanted them to see this very nice. There we go. Okay. So Here I am, and I pull, and, and just as I pull into his six and start firing, getting fire and uh, smoke out of his left engine, not as, it was just very, very little. That's an artist's conception of it. But anyway, I see a little uh, smoke and fire coming uh, out of his left engine, and he blows up his second B-17. So as soon as he, of course, as soon as he feels the hits, sees the hits on him, he starts down and dives down to the deck. And I'm chasing him. I'm lo losing my speed advantage. And then about 3,000 feet, there's a lower level of clouds, and he disappears into hit. 
So I decide uh, not to go follow a myth of after the way of catching that. And, and, at, and that, at that point, Joe, that's it. You, you don't see the 262 anymore. You don't know. That's right. That's it. You caught him I down. About him. Right. Yeah, I forget about them. I, and I'm looking for something else to do. So, and of course, be, behind me in my flight leader, Captain Tracy, he's following me down. Uh, and then, so if then, you go to the next slide, Todd. Okay, so you okay, guys then I, I look over and I see this airfield that's just loaded with uh, German aircraft. And I say to Tracy, do you see what I see? He says, yes. I said, let's go. And I started uh, started to run and we both uh, uh, made uh, two, two uh, runs and Tracy, uh, Tracy gets hits on, his, on the second run and uh, he bails out right over and lands on the lake just outside. He, he's down about 350 feet from the end to be allowed. Got a 20 millimeter right through the uh, things. I, and I see I, I see a puff of smoke, smoke and I see the canopy fly and I see him come up and see the show shoot open and he lands. Of course, this is all in milliseconds going on. And uh, so then uh, I'm by myself, so I decided just to do make some passes. I made many too many, probably four or five more. And uh, do a lot of damage, and I'm coming in on my last pass against the the F uh, FW 200, a Condor, big four engine aircraft. And as I'm going down, and I I feel a thud, and then I firing, and the Condor blows up, and I pull off, and I feel another thud, and I get oil over the windscreen. And I know I'm hit bad, and uh, so I pull up, and I'm able to get it up to 10,000 feet and uh, around 10,000 feet. And then I have to make a decision whether to go east or west. Uh, we were briefed that the uh, Allied forces were in the Magdeburg area. And of course the Russians were in Berlin. So we could try to go to the Russian side of the, which was closer or uh, Magdeburg. But Magdeburg was about, about 80, 90 miles about from where I was at the time, so I decided to try to make it back to Magdeburg. Go, go to so the I'm, slide. Next slide, Todd. So I'm maneuvering the throttles and this sort of stuff, and I get back uh, to, oh, I'm down to about a thousand feet, but I'm over Berg, and I know I'm going to have, I'm not going to make it to Magdeburg. Berg is a, a town that's uh, near Magdeburg. Uh, so I'm at a thousand feet. So I unstrap my uh, uh, my harness to bail out, and I see out of my right side at three o'clock position a FW uh, 190 coming at me, and so I do all I can to turn into him. I'm able to turn into him as he makes the pass and fires his rockets, and he misses, and. Uh, he just goes on, disappears, and I'm down about, uh, I'm, I'm burning, and I'm down about uh, 500 feet now, and so I decided, well, I can't bail out. I'm too low to bail out. Now, this is milliseconds going on in the brain, and I'm too low to bail out, and so I'm going to have to belly land it. Oh, hell, I'm unstrapped. I'll kill myself if I bail out. So I go out the wrong side, is the left side because the right side is burning. I get on the left side, I'm probably down about 350 feet by that time. And uh, so I let go and uh, it, as published, hit my knee with the, against the uh, uh, horizontal stabilizer, pull the ripcord, my chute opens, I one, swing once and land hard. And uh, I'm immediately uh, captured and uh, Taken to a uh, the airfield at Berg and uh, interrogated there for three or four days, and uh, then they shipped off to Stalag Eleven, and, and uh, from there uh, Stalag Eleven, all the prisoners. It was a British POW camp. All the prisoners and uh, most of all of the prisoners had uh, uh, already. Uh, 
evacuated and were headed uh, east uh, and uh, with the, with the uh, Germans. And then there were about 50 or 60 uh, British Tommies left, uh, enlisted. Uh, and uh, we were, I, was, I was only there the, the day I arrived and then the next morning we were roasted out and went on a forced march. Uh, to Luchenwalde, which is just outside of Berlin, where I was uh, put in the. Uh, Joe, just just a second. Home. Joe, just a second. Todd, jump two slides to the map that really nicely illustrates this. There you go. Okay. You see where I I the combat took place over Orenburg, right? He he he's 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 uh, wounded. The plane is wounded, if you will. The plane is shot uh, by ground fire. And he makes it almost to Mandenberg, but but jumps out right over Berg, right, Joe? Yeah, Berg Captain by Magdeburg. Pardon? The name is Berg by Magdeburg. Oh. Berg, the town by Magdeburg. Berg, okay. To read the map. He's captured and so he's marched back east, and you end up at this POW camp, Stalag, Stalag uh, three. Right. So pick up the story from there for us, Joe. Okay, well, we get to uh, Stalag three, and uh, lo and behold, I get in there, and who's there? Uh, Captain Tracy, and uh, uh, three other guys that uh, were also shot. Down Lieutenant Stewart, who was in the 79th Squadron of our group, was shot down in that same mission. And then two sergeants, uh, Sergeant Lewis and Sergeant uh, Cook, who were both Tagaliers uh, on the B-17s that were shot down, two of the B-17s that were shot down. And uh, so uh, we're there for about, uh, I, well, they've been there since about the 12th of, uh, of April, a couple of days after the down. So I come along at I'm probably uh, 20th of April, by my arrival. And uh, so they had already planned to, to take off. You say escape, but it's basically it minimal uh, security, and it was basically going under the fence. Uh, Sergeant Krupp had been able to, was able to speak Russian, so. Uh, we were reliant that we were going to head to the east and try to meet up with the uh, Russians. And so uh, we go ahead out and uh, started uh, walking east uh, along the uh, road, and, uh, the ditches, and uh, go about probably five miles. And here we hear this noise. It's a Russian tank unit uh, column coming down the road. So we're hiding in the ditch and Coop goes out to make contact and make contact and then we're all brought up and given out, uh, given uh, weapons and uh, uh, said hop on and off we went to that fight with the Russians. So from there we went to Jitterbug and we had a, a little skirmish there and then uh, Jitterbug over to Wittenberg and the Elbe yeah, back back up a moment, Joe. So uh, uh, they okay. get weapons. You're, you're, you're actually fighting with the Russians, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you told me the story about, uh, I think it was at Jitterberg. You, yeah. You, you walk oh, in. Oh, I know what you mean. Uh, okay. okay. The, uh, the, uh, the I went on patrol with a uh, Russian patrol. And uh, we went into this uh, apartment complex. Uh, was uh, you know very modern for that for that time. And uh, uh, we went uh, through uh, you know checking all the the apartments and stuff, make sure nobody was there and so on. And then we come to this one apartment that was really nicely furnished, a beautiful uh, uh, you know antique clocks and radio stuff like that. And this uh, patrol leader, this Russian target, he tells us to get get out of the way. And he goes in the middle of the room with this burp gun, burp, burp gun, like a machine gun. And he stands in the center of the room and he's laughing like hell and just going standing in circle and blowing everything apart with this gun. 
and I'm thinking, oh, what have I got myself into here? I, you know, I don't know about this. And uh, anyway, he was laughing all the time. But anyway, that ended, and then we, we got back into the column, and uh, there were no more uh, incidents. Uh, and we uh, had pretty well, uh, Jitterbug was pretty well under control. So went on to Wittenberg, and at Wittenberg, uh, we stopped. And, oh, but in, in, in route to Wittenberg, uh, either it was either shortly after Jitterbug or uh, just before uh, Jitterbug, I noticed that none of the other guys were around. We were in different parts of the Russian tank unit. Nobody was, the other guy, I couldn't locate him. I tried to talk to the Russians, which was, you know, with sign language and so on. And um, I couldn't get anything out of them, but anyway, I was by myself now. Uh, and I didn't know what happened to the other guys. So anyway, uh, I find out uh, uh, 65 years later that uh, from uh, Sergeant Lewis that they were all picked up by a, by a American general who came across the lines in a helicopter and met with the Russians and they took the brought him out and brought all of them out with him. And so I'm left behind. <laughs> I have no idea why or where or what happened. But anyway, I was left behind. And then off to Wittenberg. And uh, at Wittenberg, uh, Army Patrol comes across the, the Elbe. And uh, the Russians are sort of keeping me undercover. I don't know why. But, uh, they were starting to keep in the undercover. And uh, Sergeant sees this guy in this flight suit, uh, and he knows it's an American pilot. And he starts talking to the lieutenant. They talk to do a little discussion. And uh, didn't like, it looked like it was sort of arguing and so on. But anyway, finally, uh, the sergeant uh, told me to come over. And I came over. And I hopped in his Jeep and took off with the United States Army. And uh, when they were located at Halle, uh, they, they had a headquarters there. So I went uh, there and I spent about three or four days with them. Joe, uh, Joe let, me stop, let me stop you there, Joe. Back, back to these Russian troops. I mean, yeah. I get this picture, you know, sort of the popular movie picture of these Russian troops in World War II. They were, you know, sort of like the sergeant who shot up the apartment, right? I mean, yeah. The, the, were they disciplined? Were they were there officers there? I get this picture. They're drinking copious amounts of vodka every night, and then well, I, I never told you know I, that's part of the story. We stopped at a farmhouse on the way, someplace between Jitterbug and Wittenberg, and uh, they slaughtered. Uh, uh, Cows, ducks, and they had a big old, probably 20 foot table set up, 25 foot table with chairs on, and uh, raw, raw beef and duck, and everything you could think of to eat, and bottles and bottles of vodka. And I had never been drunk before in my life, but I've never been as drunk as I was there. I never had was since. <laughs> <laughs> every, every, every bite or every I mean, there was a toast to this or a toast to that. I, I don't know. I was only 20 years old, so I didn't know much. <laughs> right. Sounds like something out of a movie, Joe. <laughs> yeah. But that, uh, uh, yeah, they were, uh, another another incident that happened is, yeah, I, I lived on a bike as, as a kid. I knew a bike inside out. And, there was a, we were uh, going along, uh, I was in a truck this time, I was just driving along on the truck and uh, there, most of the stuff was uh, lead lease stuff that we that they got and uh, ears were stripped and this sort of stuff, the equipment wasn't very good. But anyway, there was a guy uh, on the side of the road with a bicycle and he was broken and he, uh, Russians were talking to him, and I said, I went over and took a look at him. He had a bad sprocket. 
So I was able to take the sprocket off and fix it up. Pass it, and after a bunch of hugs, kisses, I went on my way. I helped him with his stick spike. <laughs> it's just you know, little incidents like that, you know, just regular parts of life. So, so let's stop there for a second, Todd. So, so Joe makes it back to the American lines. He's taken in by the U.S. Army. And there's a few more stories, but before we go into those and, and then jump to the Walter, um, uh, what is it, Walter Shruck story. Shruck. Shruck story. Uh, Todd, are, any questions that the audience wants to pose? Anything in the chat room, that sort of thing? Yeah, Mr. Masters, uh, Scott Masters, put this in the chat. It's a. It looks like it, it's a little chit that was given to British pilots in case they got shot down over enemy territories. Is this what this is, Scott? And you wanted to know, did the American pilots get this? Yeah, I actually got that from a Canadian navigator who was seconded to RAF Coastal Command, and they were flying missions at the end of the war around uh, Denmark. So just in case they got shot down and came in, came across Soviet uh, uh, soldiers. Yeah, did you get anything like this? No, Jim? we had nothing. Nothing that uh, we left everything behind and all, all sorts of identification except our our uh, dog tag, and that's the only thing we had. We had nothing in Korea. We did. We had silk maps, escape and evasion equipment stuff, walk and pointy talky uh, uh, dictionaries, you know, uh, but uh, uh, nothing like that in World War II. And in our group, anyway, I can't, you know, say what the rest of them had, but I have nothing like that. Uh, on, on the YouTube side, Kilo19 asks, did the P-51 have a heater or an electric suit like the bombers, or did you just wear a bunch of clothes to keep warm? We just wore, most of the time, we would wear our, our regular type of uniform, you know, our regular uniform, flight suit over it. And uh, we did, we got the heat from the engine. You didn't have to have, to have a, a heater. We just some of, I don't know what, what the mechanics of it was, but we got heat into the cockpit uh, from the engine. Okay, great. And was there anything like an automatic pilot on a P-51 or did you actually have to be piloting the plane all six no. hours? <laughs> the only thing you had was trim tabs. You had trim, you know, you set the trim up so that uh, the aircraft flies straight level. But it, there's no, 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 nothing automatic. Okay, nothing automatic. All right, just, just got to make sure. And you didn't have an iPhone in your pocket, so you couldn't call anybody. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, we had no, not even any navigation. We had a, a beam that we once in a while would be able to hook on to, but most of it was dead record. Like I, I lost my oxygen over Czechoslovakia and uh, uh, I had to abort the mission. And uh, for some reason, normally when, when, the guy has engine trouble. They send somebody back with him, but they didn't send anybody back, anybody back with me. I was by myself. So I was, uh, I had to get down below 10,000 feet to, you know, to live. Uh, and I had no action. So uh, I'm up flying at 10,000 feet and I'm probably halfway through Germany. And uh, I see this airfield over there and I see four uh, FW-190s uh, circling thing and then I, I they spotted me they were up above me they spotted me and they started after me so i had the decision should i uh, shoot down four, four because, or should i get the hell out of here so i climbed up back into ten thousand foot clouds and then reckoned it back to england and i was right after the, the, fortunately there was a cloud deck there that was uh, Rick Erisman from the Facebook side asks, how young are you, Joe? How old are you now? I'm 96. 96. So a young 96. Yeah. And yes, Philly Rich, that uh, P-51 was the same plane that Harry Stewart, our Tuskegee Airman, who was on a few weeks ago, flew also. Yes. Joe, this is what a story. Uh, I'll shut up now. Well, <laughs> Well, Joe, uh, uh, just to summarize real quick, because we want to watch our time, you, you, you get 
back to the U.S. troops, you get to Paris, and eventually you find your way back to uh, 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 to your unit in, in England. And, and that's the end of the war for you, right? That's correct. So I, I'd like to jump 50 years to finish the story of the ME-262, because in your mind, you've totally forgotten about it, right? You yeah. go through Korea, you go through Vietnam, and uh, uh, if you jump, Todd, to slide, uh, let me find it here myself, Todd. Um, oh, it's them finding your plane. Um, there it is. Okay. There it is. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So we, we jumped 50 years. <laughs> oh, for, for more like 60. <laughs> 60 years. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I thought it was 1996 when you... It was 1996. Okay. So you, well, I don't know. tell us the story as to how and why they found your actual P-51 plane that had crash landed in Berg. I don't know what happened, but I, 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 I think you're behind that. Let me see. I, I can't see anything. I've got a, some kind of a, a advertisement that... Blocking my screen. I mean, there, okay. Uh, okay, uh, in 1997, I was, uh, I, I received a letter from Germany from a I'm, uh, Werner Dietrich, who says he was a 13 year old boy uh, laying in a ditch in. Uh, Bird on his farm, his dad's farm, and he's watching the air battle going above on the 10th of April. The, the bombers dropping bombs of Bird, this sort of thing. And uh, so he says he sees this uh, P 51, he sees the attack by a FW 190, he sees the pilot bail out land and get captured and he sees where the airplane has crashed and so on. And he said, well, and then uh, he, he jumps forward to where Berg is in East Germany. So reunification takes place and the TV stations uh, find a sort of a freedom to where they can do specials on World War II and and one of the specials they're doing is recovering uh, uh, aircraft, uh, World War II aircraft. And uh, Werner, who has become in his growing up years and so on, uh, uh, just a historian uh, uh, relative to the uh, air war over Germany. So uh, he goes to the TV stations and uh, asks them to uh, I tell them he knows exactly where this aircraft is, this P-51, and uh, where it planned. And he says he'd like to have them do their special look of that, or cover that. So they agree. And so on the top left of the, of the screen, you see they're out with their uh, metal detectors. And then on the far right of the screen, you see they hit pay dirt. They start pulling out uh, uh, material. And uh, the, the hole is about uh, 10, 10 feet deep. And uh, so it was all this stuff was down. And then in the middle uh, bottom of photo is some of the uh, material that they took up, up uh, out of the crater. And then, uh, and he says uh, that he had been uh, looking for the pilot uh, for 16 months, and uh, he finally has narrowed it down to me, and uh, he was wondering if I could confirm that, and uh, I said, uh, yes, you know, he, he said what the location was and all the circumstances. I said, yes, that certainly sounds like me. That's, yeah, that's my aircraft. And uh, so that uh, then we start emailing, I'm mean, not emailing, he, he does not have a computer, so we're uh, snail mailing back for 10 days for a letter to get there and 10 letters back, 10 days to get it back. So 
Then in the May of 97, a few months later, I get a call from the producers of the TV station. They want me to come over to do a follow-up. I said, no, I can't go over to do the follow-up. And uh, so you, uh, uh, my wife had had a stroke and I was her sole caregiver, so I wasn't allowed to leave. So they decide to pack up. They said, well, okay, if we come over there, I said, yeah, fine. So they pack uh, the whole TV crew packs up and brings murder Dietrich along with them. And they come back, come to Colorado Springs where I'd retired and uh, was living. And uh, I kept there and then uh, uh, they bring parts of my aircraft. Uh, and that's what you see in the upper middle. Those are a couple of them, a few of the parts uh, of the aircraft. Some of them are behind me. And, my office, where you may see them or not. Maybe yes. But anyway, uh, they get over there, and of course, uh, uh, Dietrich, he uh, thinks that I was shot down over Berg, uh, over uh, Magdeburg, and I just tell him the story about the 262 and all this sort of stuff. And so when they leave, he says he's going to find a 262 pilot. I said, oh, yeah, good luck. <laughs> so he takes off. And about a month later, so uh, I get a letter said, it starts out with Eureka. I found him. It's Walter Schrook, 206 confirmed uh, aerial victories, uh, 198 in the ME 109, and uh, eight in the uh, 262. And I said, well, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, he said, your st stories match. I said, well, I, I took it with a great assault. I thought, I figured probably 50 50. So that went on, I mean, for, for a while. And then in uh, 2002, I get an a, a email from uh, Werner Dietrich, who is a, a Werner Dietrich. From Christer Bergstrom, who is the Swedish, uh, uh, a prolific uh, Swedish uh, uh, author and historian who has uh, written uh, many books about uh, the air war between Russia and, and German, Germany primarily. And he was in the process of writing Walter Schuch's uh, biography. And he asked me, he said, I, I've heard that you had written uh, your account of that mission uh, shortly after the war. And I said, yes. And he said, could you send me a copy? And I said, yeah. I said, sent it to him. And about three days later, I get a message saying, 100% sure you shot down Walter Schuck. So how could you be 100% sure? He says, every detail of your account, you not knowing Walter Schuck, and he not knowing anything about you, the details of the mission are exact the same. I said, well, okay, but, but there's still, you can't be sure, you can't be positive that that could be coincidence or something else. They said, no, no, no. He said, absolutely sure, but you can relay in your uh, narrative that you saw, you, you, uh, packed this uh, 262 that had just blown, blown up two B-17s. Walter Schuch is the only one that blew up uh, on that in, in that area, in that mission, blew up two, uh, uh, 262s. In fact, he'd blown up, blown up four in rapid succession. Two of them were in a box of bombers that uh, uh, preceded your box. And uh, so he actually destroyed four aircraft. But you saw definitely had your Two, he had destroyed two B-17s. And so I accept it. And uh, Walter Schuch knows that I shot him down. And I know that he sh I shot him down, but that's all that matters. Uh, and, and, and then, okay, we want to go to the meeting of Walter. So what happened there, and this is 2002. And then in 2005, well, I'd lost my wife and my youngest son, and uh, I was in quite a despair. And uh, I get this message uh, from Krister uh, uh, and also a message from uh, Kurt uh, Schultz, who was uh, a buddy of uh, 
Walters who migrated to the United States in 1950 and was living in California. And they wanted me to come out because Walter was going to be visiting Kurt Schultz. And so uh, uh, they wanted me to uh, come down and uh, have a meeting and so on. And unbeknownst to me, a, a, a Canadian artist had uh, did, uh, did a painting depicting my shoot down of, of Walter. And they wanted us to sign that uh, print, the prints on that. So after a lot of the uh, Anyway, I came out, the short story is I came out to California and Walter and I met at uh, Vista, California on the 18th of May, 2005, and immediately became close friends. And whenever we were with the many, we spent many hours together at air shows and visiting each other. I visited him two or three, three times in Germany and then once in England, the last, our last meeting was in England uh, in uh, November of 2011 at Wendover, England, and we were signing prints. And Walter, shortly after that, had a stroke, and he, he passed away a couple of years ago. So anyway, we, were, we, we became uh, very close friends, and uh, Walter always introduced me at our meetings as, as the joke. He called me Joey, Joey Peterburs, who saved his life because when he bailed out, uh, what happened to him when he went into the clouds, just about immediately his engine started to disintegrate. He had to bail out with great difficulty and he did uh, land safely, but he sprained both of his ankles and wasn't able to fly anymore during the war. And if he had, he would have been killed. So he killed the life safe. So that was the, and uh, you can see here, and my great granddaughters call him Papa Walter. So, <laughs> no, it, it's just an incredible, incredible story, Joe. That fifty some years later, you know, you, you find this man, Todd. If if you could, can I share my screen for a moment? Because I have a few pictures I found of Walter that I'd, I'd like to show, I'm sure Joe has seen these. So let me uh, find this. Are you able to share your screen, Glenn? Yep. Okay. There, can, can you see that now? Yep, yep. That's, so the, uh, that's the picture that brought us together uh, to be beside uh, this, um, beside that one in, on the, a uh, 2005. I, I don't know how many 262s were shot down. I, I don't think too many, right? Uh, well, there were there were two the, the two. See the uh, the 262 had a hundred knot uh, advantage. I mean, it, it was a hundred knots faster than the P51, and so there is uh, only two ways you could really get to it. Uh, one and most of the 262s were, many of them were uh, uh, destroyed uh, during takeoff and landing, which at which time they were the most vulnerable. And the speed had, you know, they didn't have any advantage to them at all. And the other was if you had sufficient altitude to uh, equalize uh, the speed disadvantage. Uh, like like I said, I had twenty. I was at uh, close to thirty thousand. He is down to about twenty five thousand. And uh, for some reason, I had looked at my uh, my airspeed when I was uh, going down, and uh, I was doing four hundred and twenty indicated at uh, twenty thousand feet. And what you do to get your actual ground speed is to multiply that by two uh, percent per thousand, which is forty percent. So forty percent times uh, 420 equals 500 and some odd miles uh, or knots. And that's how fast I was going and which, you know, sort of uh, equalized our, our speed. Uh, right. He lost his speed advantage in that until he saw me and he, 
rolled out, all birds started down, and I started losing my. Uh, uh, if I'd been going any faster than that, I would have hit compressibility and probably destroyed myself. The compressibility is as you approach the uh, speed of sound, uh, your airplane starts doing very, very strange things. Here's a picture I found of Walter. I, I just, you know, love this picture. Yeah. And at this point, is there anything? The, 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 an incredible hero. Himself. The Iron Cross around his neck is the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with, uh, with uh, oak leaves. The, the history of that, the, the cross, uh, and, okay, there's a, and, so this, and, uh, this is another shot I found. Uh, yeah, that's in, uh, receiving the uh, Knight's Cross, the, the oak leaves to the Knight's Cross uh, from Herbert Gary. He looks like he's only, I, I know he's a few years older than you at this point, but uh, he he's 24. Look like he's just out of high school. <laughs> and yeah, then, he was 24. 24, yeah. Yeah. And then here's your, the man that That's became a great friend later in life. Yeah. 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 It, it, it reminds well, most me. Most of Walter's, uh, so Walter was in the, uh, Spent most of the war up in the ice bear, the north, uh, the Arctic uh, Ocean uh, area around the uh, uh, Murmansk. Murmansk. Yeah. And he was uh, interdicting the, uh, the lend lease coming in and the Russian aircraft protecting the lend lease. And so uh, most of his uh, 198 kills were uh, in, the, in the north. Uh, he was flying out of the north of Finland. But uh, Samu, uh, he tells me all sorts of stuff. Well, they had really a rough time out there. They were they had burnt. It was start a little fire under the dang engines to, to warm it up so they could get it started and stuff. I mean, it was really critical conditions. But and he he was a great uh, jazz lover, and uh, they were very, they, you know, they were so far from all of the, the, the Nazi stuff that come in, and they were up on their self. They, they, they just, uh, just do British and American music and uh, things like that. He was a great fan of uh, Loretta Lynn, who was a British uh, uh, singer, very popular during the war. And then at that meeting at Wendover, uh, Loretta Lynn was there and uh, they were able to meet. Uh, he was able to, and, and express his admiration for it. So it's kind of interesting, Joe. Your 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 World War II experience doesn't come to an end until like 2005 or so, when you and Walter reunite. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. That 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 was the culmination. Yeah. Of the experience. Todd, Todd any other questions uh, from the audience that we want to throw at Joe? Uh, no, no other questions I see, unless people want to raise their hands or just unmute themselves and ask a question, please do feel free. Todd, can I ask Joe a question? Uh, I missed in the beginning, how did you disable the 262? Was it a, did you say 20 millimeter or did you shoot it? Was it a gun? Oh yeah, it was 50, 50 caliber. I, okay. 50, 51 has as a six fifty for three fifty yeah. calibers in each in each wing, and I got actually what uh, what happened. Of uh, Walter explains that he he saw there was a there was a, a, a little uh, I don't know a, a transfer fuel transfer unit in the left wing that uh, transferred fuel from it down to the to the engine, and he said a couple of couple of hits hit that and he said it peeled back like a sardine these are his words peeled back like a sardine can and then the, the, the as i was doing that more and more uh, fuel was uh, uh thrown in and it caused the uh caused fire and eventual disintegration in the end did did he uh did he see you when you were accelerating up behind him 
Did he? Did he? No, no. He the first he I mean, he realized that was there. Is the and he got some hits. Good, Joe. Nice story. Congratulations. Nice, nice story. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Trey has a question. I know. I see it now. You put it in the chat. Trey. Uh, Trey. Trey is a fourteen-year-old from Annapolis. Correct. Yes. Got it. Got it. I didn't want to Hi, Trey. You here. <laughs> I saw some of them. Um, I had a question about when you were with the Russian tank um, unit. Did you see any combat with the Russians um, in the tank unit or, or any tank to tank combat? I know for the Eastern Front in World War II, there was more chance than the US troops of running into a tank, uh, a German tank, especially one of the big cats. Um, did you see any of that type of combat? And what was your opinion on the Eastern Front in general? Well, oh, as far as the uh, my time with the Russians, it was not it, it, the most significant was minor uh, minor clashes. Uh, at, at, you know, you'd be going down the road, you get a, a shot here and there, and have some troops go out and uh, uh, skirmish the air and, and that sort of thing. So there, no, and I I I, I did see. The Strumovix uh, aircraft uh, flying uh, support for the tank, but they were up ahead of us. The the main uh, main column was up ahead where most of the fire uh, was taken. The fighting was taking place, but I did see the Strumovix come over, and, uh, and uh, that was fun. Uh, yeah, as far as the Eastern Front, uh, I mean, uh, basically history. They, you know, they they did. The time, the winter, uh, the whole, the whole part of the Eastern War was just a repeat of Napoleon and his uh, uh, different, just different, uh, different technologies and stuff. But it's the same principle: uh, the attacking forces just we could supply and they could uh, deal with the weather. Is that answer true? No. <laughs> yes, it did. Um, it's interesting seeing okay. seeing um, U.S. people react to the Eastern Front because it, there's a lot of misconceptions about that out there. Yeah. Well, different. Shouldn't war, let uh, German ex-generals write our war records about the Eastern Front. <laughs> true story. Looks like you have quite a menagerie behind you there. Yes, I do. I have um, my German ships up here because they're a bit taller than my U.S. ships down here, and then I have British ships down there on the oh, on a bottom shelf that you can't see. Okay, Todd. Anyone else, or should we? Anyone uh... else? Does anybody else have a comment or question they want to make? Yeah, Joe, Ben Wright, I just wanted to thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your story. Uh, I mean, I admire the P-51. I flew much later, uh, but uh, just looking at that thing is like flying a sports car. All you need is a strong right leg for takeoff to right. do the right rudder. And it uh, looks like it, it really flew slick. That was the downfall of the P-38 guys transitioning into the 51. They do nothing about torque. Julia, Julia Parsons, so you wanted to ask a question. This is Julia. Uh, Joe, she was at Julia was a Navy wave in World War II. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I bet I um, can. When, when the uh, Walter went into the cloud with his plane, how did, how did anybody know that there wasn't another plane in that cloud? Great question. You didn't. <laughs> you just took a chance. So yeah, you stay. That's right. Did, you know. did you stay in the cloud if you could or not? Oh yes. I, that's what I, I I I spent probably dead reckoning back uh, when when the return from Czechoslovakia when I lost my head. I was uh, just dead reckoning uh, uh, 
from probably mid Germany to, to the uh, the English coast. Fortunately, when I dropped out, I was where I thought I was going. <laughs> Oh, thank you. So pilots yeah. would use the clouds as cover and then, in, or, or as surprise maybe to, you know, surprise your enemy or then uh, duck away from them. Well, you, you could, I, you know, they're, they're just, uh, uh, you know, it's, when, when the whole, you wouldn't want to be going into a cloud, uh, not being part of the formation, uh, unless, uh, you were, yeah, you, you, the chances were you wouldn't be, you know, hitting something if you were just wanted to. Uh, I, well, one, uh, one of my missions, we came back, I had about 50, uh, and we, we were, well, it was socked in all over England, and uh, there was, I had about 15 minutes uh, of fuel left, well, flight, we were flight of four. We had about 15 minutes of fuel left, and, uh, we were uh, above the uh, overcast about 50,000 feet. And the uh, flight leader said, well, what we'll do is we'll drop down to uh, 500 feet. And if you don't break out, then just pull up and bail out. So we all went in different directions and we started letting down at, uh, and fortunately I, uh, Broke out at a I went a little lower and I went got down to about 300 feet. Then I saw a really dull outline of it. And I got down a little lower and it was a Lancaster base and they had Fido going. And uh, Fido was the all dispersal stuff. They'd have fires burning alongside the runway, which would lift the fall. And you'd usually could get a couple hundred feet of ceiling out of it. Anyway, I was doing probably about 175, and uh, when I broke out, I saw the runway, and I just pulled back everything. I would hit the ground at about 500, and went all the way down to the landed at about 500. Oh, not hit the ground! I did a good landing, real landing, and but used up the entire runway before I was able to stop. But uh, it was. You know, the, the weather was, a, 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 at times, we were, I mean, I think that one mission, I had three hours of weather time. That's three hours of flying in the weather in the escort mode, escorting the bombers. And, you know, we'd just be able to see uh, the tips of the wings of the aircraft we were uh, with. And that was about it. Mm. It was a. Brad Washabal, you have a question. Yeah, Colonel. thank you, Colonel, for a fascinating story. Um, the losses that your fighter group suffered were mostly from ground fire or enemy uh, aircraft or pilot or mechanical failure. And the second question was, did you know of uh, famous German aces that you were going up against? Uh, were their names common like Eric Hartman and others? Were you on the lookout for them? Were they known with the other fighter pilots by name? Thank the you. The only thing I remember as far as identification is you wanted to stay clear of the yellow nose 190s. That's, that's all I remember. And I think that was a really a prestigious uh, fighter uh, outfit of Germans. But, uh, you know, they had uh, the spitter was painted yellow. Uh, and, uh, and that's but as far as Hartman, Galayan, I think it's just some of the other, but anyway, uh, I uh, never remember hearing it. We, we were briefed on the, the, the capabilities of the 262. We were briefed on the 163, the rocket uh, 163, and uh, we had, I had not personally encountered, but we had encounters of when I got there, the 262 was already uh, in service. And I think five or six of my missions, uh, there were two, 262s. Most of them were hit and run. They'd come hit the bomber. Hit and run. We, we were told, you don't check, don't even try to you burn your engine out. 
uh, trying to chase them. So we were told not to chase them. And, and then the first question, Joe, was about the casualties that your fighter group. Oh, was the casualties. Well, I think I figured it out uh, from where my uh, uh, squadron, the 55th squadron, we had about we had about 23 percent casualties for the for the war. I uh, the seven guys that went over with us, uh, we had 100 percent casualties. One was killed in training. Uh, three were killed in action, KIAs. And uh, the three of us were POWs. So, wasn't the that was, that, that's, that's near the end of the war. <laughs> wasn't the lucky seven. <laughs> no. So, so uh, Todd, uh, here we are at 8.35, and we've mo only made it through one of Joe's four wars. Yes, <laughs> right. I was, I was just thinking about that. And, and I was just thinking on July 26th, we're having a program dedicated to Korean War veterans. And Joe, I would love to invite you to come on Monday, July 26th, if you'd be available. I could email you and and, and you can share more of your story about Korea because I just think it's fascinating that they called you out of effective retirement, not having, you hadn't flown for five years and gave you a few hours in a P-51 and you were back at it. Well, I, I, yeah, just uh, send me an email and let me know uh, the time and then I'll see what I've got going on. And uh, I've got two great granddaughters that are going to college and all that sort of stuff. So I've got Busy with that tomorrow is my my oldest one, uh, Hada Rose, and she's uh, turned nineteen tomorrow. Oh, how so great! great. How great! Oh, tomorrow. she is so lucky to have you in her life and to have your well. I you know, when I moved out here in two thousand five, after my wife passed, she was only uh, two years old, and the other one was just a, a baby. So. At 80 years, 80 some odd years old, I had to learn how to change diapers again. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I put the bottle aside. I had a drug guy. I would out and take care of the girls and drink at the same time, you know. Or, 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 so I just quit drinking. <laughs> Good for you, which is, which is why you're still with us, which I'm very happy about. Thank you so much. Joe, this, is, this has been terrific. Um, and I, I will send you an invitation to join us in about a month, uh, July 26th. It'll be a Korean War Veterans Program. And of course, we'd love to have you any other time. If you can't make it then, we'll have you another time because this has been so fun and fascinating at the same hey, time. That's, that's how I like it. I really appreciate I, I appreciate you know, listening and, and, and hearing it from the horse's mouth while the mouth is still around. <laughs> <laughs> well, the horse is and, you know, speaking, it's, right. it's, just, it's just too bad. It's very, it's very, uh, very sharp. Uh, but, but, you know, most or many of the World War II vets and the Korean War vets, they don't tell their stories. They should. They should tell you know, every detail that they can remember of the story. So it is part of living history. And unless this is passed on, they, you know, unless you you know, no history, you're going to, you'll cliche, you're going to repeat it. And it's not just a cliche, it's true. Uh, and, uh, I look back to the Depression years and what led up to World War II. And I, you know, I, I, you know, I can see many things just repeating themselves with just another same old cycle going around. But anyway, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Oh, this is so wonderful. This is so wonderful. And I, I just thank you, Glenn, for hosting. And thanks to all of you for uh, those of you, especially here in Western Pennsylvania. Oh, Larry, did you want to say something else? No, no I didn't want to take up, Glenn, if you want any time. But I was just curious. So how, and again, it's getting kind of late. How did you escape from Stalag 3? We just went under the fence. You know, just broke out. Uh, there was no walked out. Okay, there you go. Yeah, just walked out. <laughs> okay, it, it was very, basically very, very. You know, most of the guards, the you know, they're 
they were running from the Russians. And, yeah. uh, and there was minimal security. There was security, but it was very minimal. And, uh, and uh, it was mostly uh, Russian prisoners. Uh, the camp was mostly, uh, there, I think we were about the only Americans uh, there. So there's some great books on the end of the war. And when you get into April of 1945 in, in that in around Berlin and in Germany in general, it truly is a, a stateless place. It there's there's no law, there's no rules. It's wandering gangs of soldiers and tankers and Russians and Americans and displaced per people. It it's it's truly a chaotic, hellish scene. So it sounds like yeah. Joe, you were you were uh, incredibly um, courageous and brave to walk through all that and to escape without. I was just a kid doing my job. I mean, we all have jobs. You do the best you can at the job you got, using the abilities you have. You do the best with your abilities that God gave you, and you work towards towards uh, achieving a mission. Uh, you're a great example of uh, American courage. And Joe, we thank you very, very much for being on. Well, Look forward very to welcome. In. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And everyone, I thank you all for joining us. And I hope you will join us on Wednesday morning again. We'll have our drill sergeant program. And then next Monday, we'll have Francis Gary Powers Jr. joining us. Uh, I always like to say this day in history. Thank you, Mary Klepper, for letting me know that today was the end of the Battle of Okinawa in 1945. Mm -hmm. And one year before, it was also the day that President Franklin Roosevelt signed something called the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, mm -hmm. which was the GI Bill. So the mm -hmm. GI Bill is 77 years old today. Very good. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Good night, everybody. Thank you.